everyone and welcome to today's webinar where I'm joined by Buzz Beauty uh, to look at launching a brand internationally and this is our second part in our webinar series uh, so if you haven't seen the first one you may want to go back and look um, but either way it's going to be new content today so there'll still be um, things that you can pick up on anyway. Um, so today's webinar is being recorded there is also going to be the chance uh, to get some questions in at the end so if you've got any questions as we go through feel free to put them in the Q&A a box we'll be happy to answer those towards the end um, and feel free to use the live chat as well if there's anything you want to share with the rest of the audience any kind of experiences and anything you want to go through um, please do feel free to put it in there as well um, today we're going to kind of cover two I guess branches um, of international uh, development there's going to be the real regulatory side compliance obviously really really important things that you need to know about about your product but we also want to kind of look in the second part of the webinar more about implementation so we know what the regulations are going to be and how important they are for your international development but I think something that gets missed a lot in these webinars is actually how do you then implement that then how do you go into those countries how do you set up up. Um, so we really want to cover that today as well. Um, so I'm joined here by Jess and Denise, um, and it'd be lovely if you could both introduce yourselves, please. Hi, thanks so much, Karis, for having us. I'm Denise Dente, the co-founder of Buzz Beauty, and we're just super excited to be here for this second part of the webinar. Thank you for having us. Great, thank you. And I am Jessica Quick, also co-founder of Buzz Beauty, and along with Denise, co-author of Whip Fire Money, our book about how to take your brand to international markets. And I think today what I'm really excited about is we are going to cover more sales and marketing. So that will be exciting for people to hear a little bit more in depth on international and how to do that. Amazing. Thanks, guys. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Karis, and I'm the Regulatory and Sales Director at ASIN Global Research. So we specialize in consumer perception research. So anything to do with how a consumer might perceive your product. Um, and obviously for international um, studies, we're always looking at getting your, your key markets and your target consumers and making sure they're the ones testing your product and concept. So you're getting your right uh, products to the right hands. Um, so just for those of um, the audience that didn't come last week, um, can one of you kind of introduce a bit more about Buzz Beauty and what you guys actually do? Sure. Buzz Beauty is a sales and marketing firm that helps owner, founders, and large multinationals really commercialize their brands, overcome obstacles, and we really accelerate brands through various stages of their growth process. We have services around four key areas, and those areas are marketing and creative services, um, product development, sales management, and then of course, global expansion. Great, thank you. So kind of to kick off our questions today, um, obviously we're talking about the compliance side and a huge part of compliance is obviously going to be registering cosmetics um, in different countries. And I think a really important thing to talk about that is actually how long can that act properly take? Uh, so if I was going to launch into a new country or several different countries, what's kind of a realistic timeline to start thinking about registering those products? Registration is definitely one of your first steps. And what we have found is there's really three parts to it. The first part for registering your product is about looking at your own formula product packaging and any of your marketing claims or advertising claims and really making sure that they're going to be appropriate for the market you want to enter. So we call this the pre-work stage because before you ever even start registration with the country, you're really looking at your own product line first uh, and making sure that it's been run through a professional that is a specialist in knowing that it's going to be compliant. So that's your pre-work period. And that obviously, you know, each brand will look at that and maybe they have to make some changes. And so it'll take a bit longer or some are ready to go. Then you, the second stage really is filing your registration. So in regions like EU, it's great because you have one source to do that. In other parts of the world, you have to do it country by country and you have to file it all with their government. It uh, absolutely can take a while. And that is another reason as you approach it to make sure that you really understand the country to then have an idea of how long it will take. 
And the third piece of that after you file is the follow-up. It will take a fair amount of you checking back in with whoever your contact is, checking in on your status, seeing what else they need. They may come back and ask for uh, some additional information. As you know, Karis, uh, substantiating some of the claims on the packaging or some additional information. So for that, absolutely, um, it's going to take a bit of time. So the earlier you can start and do your pre-work to get going, the better you're going to do. Amazing. And just uh, just for my kind of um, cheeky kind of internet, I want to know, is there any experience you guys have had that you have to say, is there a certain country that you think is maybe the hardest? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a couple in there, actually. Um, Japan is quite difficult. Malaysia, um, surprisingly enough, I had a really insane experience trying to register skincare into Malaysia. Um, and that one was a really challenging market. It took a long time. And I know uh, Denise can probably jump in on this one too, but Israel actually Israel. can take a long, <laughs> long time. And Israel is a great market. So most most brands will look at Israel and definitely see it as an opportunity. But that one can take a long time. That's really interesting. That's really interesting to hear. So obviously we do product testing. I mean, Japan, as you said, it's a long time to import cosmetics in that even for testing purposes, it can be done, but it, yeah, it definitely takes a really long time. Um, Malaysia, I think again, is reasonably similar, but I actually haven't had an experience myself in testing in Israel. So that's a great tip for us to know as well. If people want to test there, it's like, okay, let's start thinking about a good timeline ready. <laughs> Yeah, no, those are some of your longer ones for sure. And again, you know, it's so specific to the type of product you have. So if you do have something with SPF in it or something that maybe is a unique ingredient that that country hasn't seen yet, those are some of the indicators that it will take a bit longer versus more of a simple formula, what we call a simple formula, but something like a shampoo or conditioner or lotion that that's pretty much been around for a long time you're going to see a little bit faster traction with something like that yeah and this is funny isn't it because it's obviously you want to be innovative but like you said that can yeah. actually then be your debt to your detriment because it's getting it into those countries sorry yes. Disney, did you want to add also even electronics so beyond products with so many companies having various types of equipment getting equipment through to different countries can be challenging. Even a place like South Africa, getting specific kinds of equipment in there can be challenging. So really looking at not only formula and packaging, but then when you've got equipment, what does that look like to get into the markets? In some areas, it can be quite simple and other areas, it can be more complex. Yeah, I can, I can definitely again resonate with that. I remember a long time ago, so when we were very new to testing electronics, because we hadn't really done it before, we'd had a similar thing with a facial device and our client had like packaged out batteries uh, to send to the customers, but because they've been taking it out of the original packaging, we couldn't send them. So we had this box about thousands of batteries. It's great for everyone in the office. We were like, brilliant, we know we can't send them anywhere. We've got all these batteries. But yeah, absolutely, it's so, so simple, little things like that, that you just don't think about and then it can be so complex even before the registration stage just to, just to send them absolutely no it's such a good point it definitely is one of those pieces where we like to say have lots of countries kind of in going because you just never know you think you're pretty close and then it will fall out um and that definitely you know, it can be a little disheartening when you're hoping to launch by, let's say, the holiday period, or you've got this innovative product you want to get in there quickly, and it's just taking a long time. So definitely having specialists and having experts that can tell you. I think that's the big thing. And this is something we'd say it's worth the money. It's worth the spend to hire a person or, you know, for a few hours, use them as a consultant <clears throat> to understand what it's going to take to get in the market in the timeline. Absolutely. And I think, like I said, in terms of what it's going to take, um, a really big starting point, obviously. So talking about compliance is what regulations are you going to start with? Obviously, think of any country, there are so many regulations that are going to span and it's like, where do we start? So, I mean, certainly for us, from a claims point of view, 
the two regulations we look at for every single country we're looking at is cosmetic regulation, for cosmetics obviously, and advertising regulation. And that's where you're going to find the information about what claims are allowed, um, the kind of evidence that you need behind each claim. They're the kind of two that we're always looking at. Um, because sometimes in cosmetic regulation, they don't have a lot about claims. There's some countries that just kind of say, oh, you need to have evidence behind your claim. And that's about it. And it doesn't really give you much more to go on. But then you look at the advertising regulations, and even though it's not specific to cosmetics, um, there can be a lot more depth about what's actually required behind each claim there. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly whenever we're looking at different countries, before we even like start planning, sending products anywhere or recruiting volunteers, what are these regulations? What are you allowed to say? Because our clients will develop their claims a lot of the time. They're the ones that have formulated the product. They know it best. I can't really pick up their product and say, this is what you're going to say about it. That's going to be your marketing. That's what they do. Um, but certainly we say, you know, what claims have you got? And sometimes before we even send it out there, I can kind of go, whoa, 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 that's not going to go down well, or you're going to need a different kind of evidence for that claim um, just because of the territory they're in. Um, so I don't know from you guys if there's anything that you kind of think is the first step when you're looking at regulations. I think that one of the things to keep in mind is not to assume that it's just marketing copy or marketing jog jargon that many times when you're coming up with clever copy or unique USPs, you do need that expert set of eyes to say, oh, hold on a second. What you're really saying is a claim. It is something that has to be substantiated. And they can either choose to reword it and rework it or go through the process. But for us, it really is about starting with exactly what you said, the cosmetic regulations, starting with the countries that you want to prioritize in your overall international expansion plan, and then having that expert look at it and be that second set of eyes to give you feedback. Because the last thing you want to do is launch it into a country, get your pipeline you know, and your revenue stream flowing, only to have some type of disruption happen because it's now being red flagged. So those are some of the things that we recommend. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. And like you said, I mean, that's something that we'll like to do for our clients is go, OK, let's look at your copy that you have, because a lot of it, I mean, we, we always I always talk about claim substantiation, like every brand is going to us before they launch their product. That is often not the case. It's often exactly the opposite way around where they have lots of marketing on their pack copy on their website on their social media and it's more of a kind of um knee-jerk reaction to go oh my god we need to get these claims um substantiated now so yeah we'll do that we'll kind of reverse engineer the marketing jargon as you say and go okay that's a claim that's a claim we can substantiate that we can do this and do it that way um so yeah it's, it's i always kind of like think to people don't feel like you have to um, if you've already gone that far that you can't then come to someone and be like, look, I have all of these claims out there and none of them are substantiated. We're never going to dob you in. <laughs> We're going to help you and make sure you get that compliance because most of the time, as you said, it's not people get like doing it on purpose to get away with it. It just seems like marketing jargon. And suddenly before you know it, you've got 20 claims on your product that you didn't think were claims. <laughs> right. And it's such an important thing to have claims on your product. And I think that's the big thing is you do still want to give your product a reason to come off the shelf. Why is the consumer picking it up? So we're definitely saying have your marketing jargon, have your claims. And I love the, um, that advice, Kara, that if you already got in the market and you're now realizing that there's some challenges, then go back and you know, hire the right people um, like Aiton Research so that you can come back and then provide the proof but definitely anywhere you can keep it so that you have a unique point of difference. That I think we never wanna remove everything off of it so it's generic because then what's the point? No one's gonna know how to, how to use your product, why to use your product, what to expect from your product. So I definitely think it's worth doing that extra research, doing those extra claims substantiation to keep everything you possibly can uh, in order to be able to better market and sell the product. 
Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's why, I mean, we're so passionate about it. It's, it's so true. I mean, you, we have had it with brands before. We go, okay, you can't be saying that because it's not substantiated. And they go, okay, well, we'll just take it off. It's like, that's yeah. fine. But then what are you left with? And it's not a lot. And do you are you really that confident in your brand that you have to say nothing about your product whatsoever and it's going to sell? Um, <laughs> it's not very realistic. Um, but certainly, I mean, that's something we can help with. And there is kind of two branches to claim substantiation, as I mentioned kind of briefly early, and I won't go into too much depth, but it is a very important stage in that kind of registration process and in compliance. But there's always kind of two methods of substantiation. God, I can't even say it. Um, there's consumer perception, which is what we conduct in-house. And there's clinical studies. So there's always kind of two different levels of evidence that you're going to be required to get um, and different claims and different products are going to require different things. Um, so that's really what we're helping with. Clinicals, your instrumental studies, um, for anyone out there who doesn't really understand what I'm saying, uh, clinicals or your instrumental studies, your kind of claims where you're saying hair is five times stronger or hair has got, um, I'm not hair, uh, skin's got 50% more water retention. These are all things that are measurements. We need to make sure we have some clinical evidence because a consumer can't just say that. Um, and your consumer perception claims are much more to do with uh, the look and feel. It might be my hair looks and feels healthier. Um, my skin has never looked more youthful. These are the kinds of claims that we're really looking to get that way. Um, so if you're ever unsure, that's really where we help with. As we said, we do the consumer perception, but we have labs that we work with that do the clinical. Um, so that's really where we can step in. Um, but certainly kind of talking about the claim side as well. Um, for us, um, a huge thing is also with the USA and the UK um, or the EU, there is a real difference in how um, people will use their claims quite a lot. Um, and I kind of want to know from your side as well, does registering a cosmetic really differ a lot from the USA to the EU and UK? Denise has some good stories about this one. So I am tossing this to Denise. <laughs> Um, yes, there are differences for sure. Um, you have to do different things in the different countries for sure. And it is important to know if you're going to be marketing in the EU and within the EU, what you can and cannot say and what claims you can and cannot make. Um, always right now in the US, this bit, there's this big movement about free of and free of this, free of that. And we continue to see it on things. And we know that the moment we see that on packaging and then trying to take it into the EU, it just, we know right from the get go that that's going to have to be something that changes. So there are differences. There are differences when it comes the other direction as well. So I have had um, and brought product in from Italy as a sunscreen and realizing that in the US, it's considered a drug. So there are things in both directions, uh, things that you can and cannot say. Um, and so really having that expert for those markets is so important. And that's just the bottom line. In a lot of this, it's complex because you've got so many countries around the world and you have government agencies that are putting these rules in place and they're constantly changing. We're advising our clients right now that there are some rules coming into effect in March, 2021, that we've got to start planning for right now for the EU. March, 2022. So March, 2022, <laughs> excuse me, March, 2022. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's really super interesting that the changes also impact us. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such a very good issue point about the um, change in OTCs and cosmetics. Yes. Because I, I remember doing the same thing. We went to test a sunscreen in the US and I was like, oh, we can't oh. test this as a cosmetic. This is now a drug. Oh no. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting. Like, and that happens a lot across um, the world as well, we've noticed. Um, so I think that's such a, a very, again, a lot of people probably know this, but you'd be surprised. Like I, I didn't know it until quite a lot later on down my career. Um, so it's such a good thing to bring up. Um, this and yeah. time of year, this time of year, it always brings to mind too cellulite. Cellulite creams has been another one that has been borderline between a cosmetic and a drug, depending on how it is formulated and what the claims and so forth are. Yeah. So even cellulite creams 
Yeah, interesting fact too for the US, if it's a cosmetic, so it's not an over-the-counter or an OTC um, or some of these other kind of cellulite sunscreen, it actually doesn't have a registration process. There isn't anything to register inside the United States for a cosmetic. So that is where it's actually kind of nice. You can bring things in as long as they don't fall under that drug category. And the FDA is who regulates that here in the US. And so you can pop on to the FDA website and see exactly what would be considered a drug. It's funny too, we actually have some that are even considered a cosmetic and a drug. So you have cosmetic, no registration necessary, bring it in. Then you have a drug that's registered and a cosmetic and drug that's registered. So it's actually, if you've got something pretty, um, pretty great that you don't have to classify as a drug, U.S. is a great market to come into. Absolutely. I mean, it's, at the end, of it, it's the biggest cosmetic market in the world. Of course, it's great. Yeah. But I do think that's a really good point. I mean, I'm going to always go back to the point of claims. But we have that so much with um, American brands where because there's no registration process, they forget about that claim side and they go, OK, well, they, you know, they're not thinking about the regulations. But of course, you've then got the FTC who are your advertising federal (laughs) and they're going to come in and they are going to sue you if you get something really wrong. Obviously it has to be quite bad, but you know, that, that is what you do tend to see. So as great as it is to go through that registration process, I think it really helps protect a lot of brands over here where, you know, someone's got to review your claims. You have to have a responsible person. They're going to review your claims to register. Um, so that kind of side, there's, yeah, there's a lot of kind of startup brands in the US that I think can get tripped up by mm-hmm. making claims and then going, oh, wait, there's no cosmetic kind of thing. I'm breaking here the registration. Yeah. But advertising regulation, yeah, you've gone out the window because you've just all lied to your consumers. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it's a really, it's a really, really good point that, definitely. Um, so a little less, sorry, I'm going to, I've been talking off topic a lot. I need to catch up on my questions a bit. Um, but yeah, is there, so is there a danger of breaking the law? If you were to sort of set up a business strategy and a marketing strategy in one, um, kind of country and you just go, okay, I'm going to completely replicate that and do that in another country. Is there kind of an issue where you could, I don't know, break the law? So I don't know, if, you know, you've got like kind of local ownership, which you have to have in certain countries. I don't want to give away the answer too much because you guys know way more about this. <laughs> but yeah, is that, is that quite risky to kind of just try and just duplicate what you're doing somewhere else? It is. Um, yes. How you set up your business in these different countries and how you do business in those countries can definitely differ. There really is, there may be laws, there may be regulations, there may be just tax benefits for setting up a company a specific way. So it is important, again, to look to uh, somebody like in the legal field that can help you figure out, okay, if I'm going to do business in a country like Australia, How should I set up my business there? Should I use a distributor? Should I set up a subsidiary? Should I do a JV? Um, Do I have to have somebody who is a director in my company that's actually a resident? So in the case of Australia, you may find your business structure and how you set it up may require you to have somebody that is a local resident. Or you may have another country that if you're doing business in that country, and you're working with a distributor or a JV and you're forming that, um, majority share may have to be owned by a local um, resident, a local person that is a national citizen of that country. So you really do have to look at each of the countries that you wanna go in and figure out what the proper setup is going to be. And there are resources for that. I know here in the U.S., the U.S. Trade Organization um, that's part of our federal government can help you figure some of that out. Amazing. That you said, it's, it's, it's sort of quite overwhelming. And actually, it's really important as well, because when you do learn about these things, and if you'd have to have a majority share someone, it might be that it's not worth your kind of approach to that country as well. Um, because I mean, I, again, I know that we've had certain interests in certain countries and we go, oh, no, wait, I don't know anyone who lives in this country. I have no one I can trust to take over a majority share in that franchise. 
so absolutely um and just kind of before I want to do like a kind of summary in a minute with some key takeaways but is there anything you kind of want to um give away as well in terms of where do you start if you're looking at local regulations and law where do you really want to start researching yeah, there's really two areas, of course, that you're going to start. One is going into that country's specific governing body that governs cosmetics and or governs your, um, your business model. So to Denise's point, the employment laws or any of those pieces. So obviously going to the specific pages of those governments and online are great. And then the other big thing that we have found is working and finding a company that has multiple offices worldwide so that you can potentially have them here. They might be based in your home country, somewhere like UK, but they also have an office in Germany, an office in Hong Kong and so forth. And so they have sister partners, if you will, or companies that they are able to reach out to um, and get additional information for you. We've been blown away, honestly, by the U.S. Um, Commerce Department here, our government department that manages trade. They have so many resources. And if you are a company that is 51 percent made in the United States, they will use their resources with you. So they will call local embassies and ask information if they think there's a law coming down and they've heard, like Denise mentioned, March 2022, there might be something. Let me reach out to the embassy in Belgium and see what they um, know about this. And so definitely your local um, your local government has got a ton of resources and it's in their best interest, right? To help your, your trade. So those areas are really where we start. That's amazing. And I, and I have to say for anyone that's listening in from the UK, exactly the same from my experience from the Department of International Trade. They also do the same thing. They help out and they also are very, very keen to give funding for businesses. They want you to have grants so you Yay. can spend money abroad. So absolutely, I yes. agree. Always go to your local government because you'd be surprised how much they want to help you because, you know, UK or US businesses and other countries is what we all want. Uh, so I'm just yeah. going to share the presentation again um, and just do the kind of... Yeah, while, while you pop that up, we actually, uh, we were looking for a, a great partner in Brazil and we were having such a challenge and we reached out here in the US to the Commerce Department and actually went under the Commerce um, Department, got the visa that way and attended the trade show with them and was able to kind of have a home base, met a lot of great people. And so even without, you know, this was... 10 years ago, but without the network, that being able to have that government agency was a really, really great benefit. Exactly. It's um, it's always that kind of don't ask, don't get attitude. <laughs> yeah. Or if you're going to go anywhere, just ask first. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> See what you can get. <laughs> and there's so many people on the U.S. side that they work almost by city or by region. So it's not as if there's only one or two people to contact. There are lots of people in the org organization and they're very, very well versed in it. And funny enough, because beauty and cosmetics have become so large, our interactions with them have been fantastic because they're very aware of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish and been very helpful. So I would definitely encourage people to, you know, access their own local governments. There's a lot of resources that they offer. Amazing. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, so just to kind of like round off that section, um, as they mentioned earlier, Denise and Jess have made, um, written a lovely book called Whip Fire Money, which is a really helpful guide for anyone doing their international business. It's actually how we got to talking and why we wanted to deliver these webinars. Um, and as part of that, there's kind of different chapters and you get a bit of a checklist at the end. So I just wanted to summarize with that checklist for compliance. Um, so how do you know you're ready on the compliance from... Well, you need to make sure you've identified a regulatory support team who can guide you through the process um, or make sure you have someone in your team already. Uh, you need to have access to the essential compliance documents. As we mentioned, things to do with registration, anything you need um, documentation wise from that local government to be able to um, register the products. Um, you need to have a professional, a legal professional who understands and has the skill set to support your expansion plans. Again, the legality is very important. Things like terms and conditions, any kind of legal contract that means you can launch, launch your business somewhere else is so important. 
And you need to be willing to put your best effort into remaining compliant. This is such a huge point, as we say, said earlier. You need to make sure that you're aware of those regulations and that you're always keen. You can't just think, oh, I'm just going to try and get in there, hope for the best to sell my products. Stay on top of it because nothing can be more detrimental to a company than becoming uncompliant and getting a bad reputation. Um, and you need to acknowledge that you're going to make mistakes, but commit to learning from them as well. And as we said, ask for that support, go to the government, make sure that you can get the support, because that's really is what's going to help you um, be successful when you're looking at compliance as well. So much more kind of onto the other side then now, I really want to talk more about the kind of implementation about sales. So we kind of said about the sales and marketing, this kind of terminology is thrown around quite a lot. So from your side, what would you say is sales and what would you say is marketing? <laughs> That's a great question because today it's so blurred. So I do like the ability to define it. Uh, we define marketing really as the department that goes and finds your customers and tells your customers about the brand. So marketing is the one, it's spreading out that wide net, it's defining what the product is and what the positioning is. That's marketing. Sales is the one that turns it into revenue. It's the one that gets the customers to buy. So in obviously in the cosmetics world and so forth, you've got your team that might be walking in and talking to buyers at retail locations to get them to put the product on shelf. Obviously that's clearly sales. Today it's interesting, right? With digital that it gets so blurred. Um, and so we actually call it a sales funnel because marketing will put up the website, they'll write the copy, they'll make sure the product is represented correctly. But then it's about the sales funnel of targeting the right people on the online and getting them to come and convert and what is making them convert. Are they discounts? Is it copy? Is it imagery? And so that sales funnel, um, even though it's not a salesperson per, um, per se, it's really when the action of taking that customer and getting revenue from them. So that's how we're defining it. And in when it comes to international, there's um, there's a blend because of the fact that you're building a market, you're going out and opening up, introducing new clients, new customers to the product, but then you're also having to convert them over to to actually purchase. And um, and so that can sometimes be done individually. You have a marketing department for international and a sales department for international. In the beginning, though, we definitely see it's a bit merged and that's totally fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Definitely. It's like you say, because obviously the marketing is going to be going to be sales. You're not, you know, you're going to help make those sales that way. But I think it's so important to define it, as you said, because it helps you manage your teams and manage your strategy instead of just kind of doing that, casting it out wide and then going, OK, well, how do we turn these into sales now? We're saying what we do. Um, so I think defining it's really, really helpful. And also like. Um, in your book, I know you mentioned about kind of global marketing and international marketing. So what is the difference there as well? <laughs> so what we have found in larger organizations, for instance, larger organizations will typically have a global marketing team. It's their brand team. It's the team that wakes up every day, um, even if it's just one person, and thinks about what does our packaging look like? What is our positioning? What are we saying about this brand? What sets us apart? They're thinking about the brand in totality. They're doing product development because they're looking at the white space. They're, they're not so interested in what channel it's being sold in. They're more interested in, in what and how the brand feels. And that's your global team, typically. Um, and then in those bigger organizations, they will have what we call a trade marketing team. Trade marketing really cares about what channel you're being sold into. So you'll have a team potentially for international that is considering, okay, global created this beautiful new product. The packaging looks great. This is the campaign for it. How are we going to sell it in international? And then they're going to create additional pieces or really think about how they're going to teach and train the international teams to sell that product um, in that channel. And you might also have an e-commerce marketing team. You'll definitely have a domestic marketing team because, again, they care more about the channel that it's being sold into. So it's really just a difference between trade marketing and brand marketing. The smaller companies, if you're a startup or um, you maybe been around for a few years, but your marketing department isn't big, you can definitely have a global uh, a person that gets up and does product development and can think about the channel. And then obviously, as you grow, you may eventually spin off and have a specific person that manages international. 
mostly because international is going to have a lot of questions. There is going to be a need for some level of localization. And there's also a lot of just knowledge. Again, like we've been talking about the last two webinars and understanding what are the laws, what are the compliances, what are the rules? And really, if you have a strong international marketer, that person is really going to help the rest of the company understand we can't sell this product like this. We're going to have to do these things. Um, and so we really strongly recommend once you have that international, there's someone that's very, um, very skilled. They've got a lot of education behind them to do that piece um, experience, if you will. Absolutely. Like I said, it's the experience. That's what's always going to make it. And I think what's so important when we talk about international marketing as well um, is brand consistency. And I think that's where it can be tricky with marketing, because obviously you don't want to make something to appeal to every single different country, but you need to keep it really consistent. Um, so in terms of like our advice for keeping a brand consistent, it's always about product testing and concept testing. And I know we were actually chatting about that earlier. Um, so you don't always have to go about claims. That's not what consumer research is all about. It can be about testing a concept. And it might be that you've got a concept that is tried and tested in one territory and you want to get some feedback on that in another territory. So it could be things like online group, uh, market research, a questionnaire which has pictures. It could be that they get sent a product to test, but with all the branding alongside it. Or it could be things like focus groups, which are very similar set up to this, uh, where we have volunteers from that country to come and talk to us. Um, so obviously that's, you know, that's not going to keep it consistent, but it can give you that feedback from the people you are trying to reach. So if there is anything to do with your brand, and it might even be that you're looking at the branding you're trying to give it and the branding you already have and going, does this look like the same brand? <laughs> it can be as simple as that. Um, yeah. and I think that's really helpful as well. But have you guys got any tips about how you can keep your brand consistent when you're marketing internationally? I always circle around four key tips when it comes to branding consistency. I think that's the the biggest thing, right, that you just mentioned is you want the brand to look and feel the same no matter what market it's in. So the first tip that we have is trademark. Try to trademark your names. Um, if you have not only your brand name, but if you have product lines that you can trademark, that goes a long way because once something is trademarked, it doesn't have to be translated. It becomes its name, which makes it much easier when you're in a market to be able to call the item by its name because it's trademarked. So our first tip for brand consistency is trademark what you can. We understand there's limitations and so challenges, but I always start there. That's your first one. The second one I think is a great point you brought up earlier about claims and copy. When it comes to marketing copy, Write the things that matter so you can sell your product, but then get them substantiated, get them proven so that you can use them abroad. And so don't just take it all off or try to be generic. Um, that's not the way to go for this. Our second tip really is about substantiating those claims. And so you can go out on a really strong leg on how to sell that product. Our third tip is at, really with campaigns and assets is to diversify those assets. So if you're running a campaign, use a few different models, use different um, hero images. So under one campaign, you can have five or six options. And really where this helps is what turns on the client or customer in Northern Europe may not be the same thing that turns on the client or customer in Hong Kong or Southeast Asia. So having a few options available, um, not just from models, but even hand positions or skin tones or um, even the way the facial expression is. I've been amazed over my um, last 15 years of doing photo shoots of face and how it comes across is very important in different cultures. And it's something subliminally I don't even think we realize. But if we have options that then the international market could pick up, the campaign's still the same. We're still talking about the same thing, but now we've given them choices. And that gives us that consistency. I think it, that is super helpful um, really to, to keep it similar and not feel like you're doing one campaign for one market and a totally different one for another. Most of us don't have the resources to do that. And or worse yet, your distributor partner or your partner in country, a JV or however you've set it up, doesn't find the assets and resources that they need. So then they go out and spend their own money and time doing their own photo shoots and so forth. And it either becomes very inconsistent with the total messaging 
or it's just an additional amount of time and money that has been spent in the local market that could have been um, curtailed from the beginning. Yeah, our fourth one actually dovetails with this too. Our fourth tip is find a strong art director or creative director that can oversee the brand. And in today's digital world, we've got social media handles. You most likely will have a local social media handle because it is local. There's local customs and holidays and things that matter topical. And so your social handle will reflect that. If you have a strong art or creative director that can oversee and see, okay, yes, this is still in vain with the rest of the brand, the color palette's still there, the imagery is still along the same lines, the patterns and feeling of it are the same, but it's obviously different imagery because in that market, we're talking a little bit differently about or showing a little bit differently. And so one of the big things I think that um, in today's world with, uh, with social websites, all of that, as you have all these different markets carrying your brand, if you can have someone that you can run back to and say, look, does this feel like the brand? And they've got that eye, that's really going to go a long way uh, because it doesn't have to be exactly matching. It just needs to carry that same tone all the way through. Yeah, that makes all sense. There's a really incredibly helpful tip. Like you said, it's about making sure that you get the best out of your team as well. There's no point having these different marketing campaigns. It would be a huge waste of money when you think about it that way, when actually if you just get loads of options, you've got loads of options. It's perfect. Yeah, um, I mean, you get big and great and you maybe can open a subsidiary in different markets or that's how you're choosing to run it, then absolutely they can get more localized. But in the beginning, we find... Um, even, you know, companies that are doing 30, 40, 50 million dollars, they definitely are trying to find the best ROI and marketing can be expensive. So how do we leverage it across the world? How do we stay consistent so that ultimately, no matter what market you walk into, you recognize the brand? Keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I'd also love to know as well, so we've kind of talked about the marketing side, but in terms of like the sales side as well, what would you say are really good tips for finding the right people or the right companies and agencies to actually represent you when it comes to looking at those more local sales? Yeah, sales definitely becomes the part where we bring in the revenue stream. So you want to pick your partners really, really well from the beginning, ideally. So sitting down and having your plan and taking the time to list out, what am I expecting my salespeople or sales teams to be doing? Are they going to be doing things that have and require more business acumen? Like, are they going to be negotiating contracts? Are they going to be helping with legal and regulatory issues? Are they going to be helping um, build the brand in the market versus just selling the product? So part of this comes from sitting down and having and building a sales plan of what the expectation is from the people that you're going to hire. What we find um, is when you're hiring in-country might be different than the kind of people that you were hire outside your home country because the skill set and the need may be different. For a U.S. company, hiring somebody that is either going to live in the U.S. and work internationally or live internationally and interact with the home office, there's different complexities that come with that. And so understanding what do I expect my salespeople to do does that require a higher level person? And in many cases it does, then do we expect them to know things like local laws, um, some of the local regulations? Do they have local contacts that we want them to have? So understanding the kind of person that you wanna hire and the skill set that they need is definitely one of the first starting points from a tip standpoint that we have. And then from there, really listing out, all right, now that I know the kind of person that I need, am I looking for an employee? Do I have an appetite for that? Employees, hiring them in different countries, you definitely are going to want to have some review of that legally. Do you need a contract with them? Because in different countries and 
People think that everyone operates the same sometimes, even holidays and the amount of time off that a different uh, employee in a different country might require legally or might expect culturally is different. So understanding, am I gonna hire them as an employee? What are my obligations in the way of insurance, retirement? Um, how do I manage people remotely? What can and can't I do? Um, if I do end up finding the person doesn't work out, what are the termination rules? Because that changes. So then if you choose not to hire an employee, do you want an independent contractor? And you run into similar, um, having those agreements in place and having some legal support with that. Or do you want to hire an agency to do it for you? There's also even third-party agencies that will help hire and manage and keep you compliant. We see this a lot in Asia, a lot in Asia, where working with a third-party company to hire salespeople is quite common. And then really kind of this last piece is how are you planning on measuring and tracking and coaching and mentoring them? Because again, they will need all of this support and they are working in global markets. So how will you be supporting them? Um, what assets will they be having access to? How will you support them internally with your home country team and so forth? So there is some things to think about the kind of people that you want to hire. And we find oftentimes that it's best to hire somebody that really does have that inter international acumen as opposed to someone who's more junior. Oftentimes the international department sort of comes along and you may end up taking someone from your home country and then promoting them or moving them over to international but they may not actually know the international markets. They may not know the currency, they may not know the culture, they may not have the local relationships. So while they know the company very well, they may not know the market well. Um, and again, there are agencies that can step in and help. That's one of the things at Buzz that we do is sit down and help brands come up with their international strategy, how to find people and help them through all of that process if they don't know where to start and grow their business internationally. I think it's so great you guys help with that because that must be one mm -hmm. of the most intimidating parts. Because like you said, you, if you send in one of your own, they're not going to know the countries. And if you get someone else, like you said, unless you're really willing to sort of sit with them and make sure they understand your brand, what's, there's no point hiring someone if they're just going to be like, right, this is this product, this is the brochure I've been given, you know what I mean? And they're, yeah. they sell it that way. Um, it's not going to, you know, they're representing your brand. It's so important that they're a big part of that. And I know you kind of touched on it as well, but pricing, we're definitely going to have to do, I think, a whole webinar on pricing because people <laughs> are so interested in it. Um, but absolutely, like when, like you said, you are got a huge part of sales is negotiation. And if they don't understand how your product's supposed to be priced, and again, they just have a kind of price sheet, it's going to be really, really tricky to get that. So I think there are some hugely important points there that we're just going to have to, we're going to have to just do another webinar about them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Even just, even just negotiating um, from a cultural standpoint and yeah. having contracts available, how you negotiate in the Middle East or how you negotiate in uh, Asia is going to be very different than how you negotiate in Scandinavia. So those kinds of intricacies to international, just super important. Absolutely. I must admit, as it, yeah, I've always been, when I've gone to other countries, I've always gone with someone who is the one negotiating when I was a bit more senior. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty terrifying when you go in there and go, okay, what's this new culture? What have I got to do now? It's, it's really intimidating. It's so important to have someone who knows what they're doing. Otherwise, you could make some real bad mistakes as well. So I'm just going to yeah, share. You know, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. I was going to say that it also very much like we talked with distributors or your business model in market, you can have different models with your sales team as well. You can have an employee in one market. You can have a consultant in another. You can have some base in your home. So it isn't, uh, again, you have one set path and it's okay, we've made a decision. It's all employees. And it's only that because you can diversify depending on, like Denise said, those rules and laws, um, you decide, look, those are too intense. We're not going to be able to adhere to them as well. 
let's do a consultant or let's do a third party sales rep group. You can mix and match, which is also goes back to our original points about being flexible with international. Absolutely. I said it's the same thing's not going to work in every country. And again, it's it's always always looking at each country as a separate thing, I think, which is a huge take home from today. Um, but yeah, just to go through this um, marketing and sales checklist as well. Um, and while I'm doing this, if anyone has any questions, if you want to pop them in the Q&A, because we'll go to Q&A straight after this. Um, so for your marketing and sales checklist, always make sure you have written brand guidelines. Again, that's going to be something that will help with your consistency. Um, you need to have, uh, sorry, I'm going to just have to move my camera thing. Uh, you have a mechanism to pass along files, high res images and marketing content. As we said, it might be that you have one kind of big shoot that you can do and use all those options in different territories as well. Uh, you need to have spoken to a legal professional for guidance on managing those social handles. As we said before, each social handle is going to have slightly different uh, ways to connect with your consumers in those territories. Um, make sure you've identified the type of salespeople you want to have to sell your brand, as Denise said, and make sure that you have your budget, conversation planning KPIs to all kind of align with that as well. Make sure that you're training, onboarding, and managing those salespeople. Don't leave them to their own devices. They are your brand. It's so important they're representing you. Have the assets and tools to support them. Again, help to support them. Don't kind of leave them out there <laughs> and then leave to their own devices. And make sure that the contracts and all the employment law is is kind of in line with those territories as well don't get tripped up um make sure that you're always staying compliant as well as your product with your people as well um, make sure you have the processes in place and they will evolve so make sure that you're developing your procedures as you go along the way um, and make sure you have a method that will always ensure that you're going towards the same goal your sales and marketing should work together and as i said that kind of sales funnel will help with that as well so thank you so much, guys. We're going to go to a q and I can't see any questions in, um, but obviously, as, um, as always, I'll share the recording um, with everyone and that will have the contact information for Buzz Beauty and Ata Global Research. So you can reach out to us if you do have any questions after this. I won't hold anyone up too much. I don't know, before I kind of round up, do you guys have anything else you want to add? I don't want to put you on the spot, but I don't want to give you, stop you having a chance to have your say either. I always just want to encourage people. Oftentimes uh, when you read something or you hear something, it sounds hard. And yeah. I, I, just to know that just get started, just start. And there are plenty of people and plenty of resources out there and it is worth doing. And I know when we work with our clients, we can break it down to the smallest, easiest steps, create a checklist and just check it off and start the process. It sounds complicated. There are a lot of moving parts, but there are resources to help you do it. And it is worth doing. Absolutely. I think that's a great note to end on as well, Denise. Yes. Great <laughs> note to end on. <laughs> uh, so just to finish up, I do have some upcoming webinars. Um, so next week, we'll be looking at claim validation and the real consumer voice. Um, so we'll be looking at some consumer insights to do with what is claim validation means to them as well. Um, I'll be looking at breaking down some particular advertising claims and how to substantiate them. So on the 3rd of September, we'll have skincare advertising claims. And on the 9th, we'll be looking at makeup advertising claims. And at the end of next month, on the 23rd, I'm going to put a spotlight on wellness and emotive claims because it's a huge way that the industry is going. And how do we use people's kind of emotional reaction um, and kind of the wellness industry to make sure our claims are resonating with those consumers as well? So there is our contact information. As I said, I'll be sending that out as well with the recording, but I just want to say a huge thank you to joining me again, Denise and Jessica. Your input is invaluable and I'm so pleased you're able to join. Thank you so much for having us, Karis. And we keep doing this so late on a Friday for you. I think next time we need to have cocktails or something because it's only fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always down for cocktails. <laughs> okay, next one we'll have cocktails. Amazing. And the audience, we invite you to have a cocktail with us next time as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining everyone. And I hope everyone has a fantastic weekend. Thank you. Thank you.